Hey everybody, it's another follow-up Friday video. This is Pastor Chris and I am coming to you from my home office here in Manassas. So last Sunday, we talked about the first two of what will be three spiritual habits or routines or disciplines of disengagement or subtraction. And these are crucial habits or rhythms for you and I to utilize because we live within a culture that is afflicted with the disease of more. So if we want to steer another course and not be, as St. Paul says in Romans 12, 2, conformed to the pattern of the world around us, we need to learn how in our own way to use these habits. The two that we covered last Sunday are fasting and Sabbath keeping. Probably both fairly unfamiliar to you, or at the very least, disciplines that you probably don't utilize very often. In fact, they may even be a little intimidating. So below the link to this video in this email, there are several resources for you to use to learn a little bit more about fasting and Sabbath keeping, understand it a little better, and also practically figure out how you can do this uh, in your own lives, according to your own distinct needs, etc. So one of the links below is to one of my very favorite Christian periodicals uh, for those who are in the 40 and under crowd. Um, if you ever want to uh, hear about Christianity and how to communicate it to millennials and younger generations, I would highly recommend this periodical. periodical. It's called Relevant Magazine. So in Relevant Magazine, an author by the name of Thomas Christensen wrote an article entitled The Most Neglected Spiritual Discipline and Why It's Important. He's speaking of fasting. And in the article, he actually talks about his own fasting during the season of Lent. But what he says is applicable to trying to use fasting any other time in your life. So here's part of what this author says to such a young audience or younger adult audience about the ancient Christian practice of fasting. Quote, Fasting is not about punishing ourselves. I didn't give up electronics and sleeping late because I'm a terrible person who deserves punishment. This isn't a modern version of flogging oneself to demonstrate religious devotion. Instead, fasting is about creating space for introspection and refocusing our faith in an age of consumer content that mercilessly seeks our attention. You're making a choice to say, God, you're bigger than these things in my life, not as proof to him, but rather as a reminder to yourself. Isn't that a very freeing way to understand fasting? Maybe that helps you break from some of the misunderstanding that's out there about it. Now about Sabbath keeping, I want to relate to you a great story that is told by John Ortberg in his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, which will be one of the resources that I recommend to you at the end of this sermon series. So John Ortberg, you probably know that name. We've used a book of his during my time at Culpeper Presbyterian. In his life, in his Christian development, and also as a pastor, um, he got to the place where he was very frustrated with his own growth, and his just own, his own pattern of being, and the well-being that he lacked. And so he sought out um, a spiritual mentor, and that person happened to be Dallas Willard. That's a name you might recall now because I've used it quite a bit over the course of this series. Dallas Willard is easily one of the two most influential writers on spiritual disciplines or habits in the last 70 years. Richard Foster's the other one. So, 
John Ortberg approached his spiritual mentor, Dallas Willard, and he tells this story about the conversation that they had. Quote, he goes to Dallas Willard and he says, I am so frustrated. What do I need to do in order to be spiritually healthy? Expecting some bullet points and some great wisdom from this spiritual giant, Ortberg took out a pad of paper and a pencil and waited. And Willard replied, You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. After pausing and a re-emphasis of the same statement by Dallas Willard, Ortberg wrote it down. And yes, in a hurried fashion, Ortberg then asked, well, what's next on the list? There is nothing else on the list, said the wise man. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life, for hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our world today. Think about that for a minute. You and I don't really hold a candle to the experience or expertise on spiritual growth and spiritual disciplines that Dallas Willard does. And when he was asked, what is the key for me to become more spiritually healthy in my life, his answer is eliminate hurry. How would you have answered that? I don't think I would have answered it Dallas Willard's way. And it is the discontinuity between my potential answer and his actual answer that reveals his deep wisdom. That's what Sabbath is all about. Sabbath is about breaking from hurry and the tyranny of busyness in our lives that is so often self-imposed or imposed by the cultural expectations around us. So there are a couple of lists that I have included in this email that I've just pasted right into the email for your use. And I want to look at a little of what's in the list with you before I tell you some stories and how I use fasting and Sabbath in my own life. So first, from the book, Rest, Living in Sabbath Simplicity by Carrie Kent, I want you to notice in her list of how to integrate Sabbath into your life these points that she makes. Number one, uh, this is the second point on her list. She talks about reconnecting. And the last sentence is priceless in that paragraph. Quote, Sabbath is an inclusive event that flattens the social hierarchy, which is to say we should, we should seek to help one another, each and every one of us, regardless of our class, education level, age, gender, etc., to practice Sabbath. More pragmatically, spouses, one of the greatest gifts that you could ever give your partner is to allow them the freedom to practice Sabbath and to do whatever it takes for you to allow them to do that. Now, fifth on her list is the subject of playing. And that may not be a word that you've heard associated with spiritual growth or habits much, but the more you read about it, the more you'll find it. Playing. What she notes is that for more extroverted folk, that they find refreshment through interacting or connecting with people. So, if you and I were going to practice Sabbath, either a day, or if we wanted to take small steps into this habit, maybe just part of a day, maybe what we would do is make sure that we pursued relationships or being with people in a way that often we're not able to the rest of the week. For from them we will gain energy. From them we will gain healing. Now the next list is from a book called Pilgrim Heart by a Church of Christ pastor named Daryl Tippin. And I want to point out again just a few things from his list about how to keep Sabbath 
in your own life. First on his list is the idea of retreat. The first sentence is priceless. Retreat from the world is one of the best ways you serve others. If you are committed to loving your neighbors, caring for others, giving the best of yourself to those in your church, those in your family, those at your workplace, your friends and acquaintances, etc., then one of the things you have to do is be committed to rest or Sabbath. Because if you're exhausted or stressed out, they are getting a worse version of you. How many church problems, how many church arguments have at root the problem of people being stretched too thin and therefore not having the capacity to treat each other with respect and to give one another grace? The answer is lots of them. Third on his list, again, please note, he talks about play. So in two independent lists about what a Sabbath might look like in your life, play is a crucial part of it. Number four on the list, Sabbath helps us embrace imperfection. And if you read that paragraph, what he means is it helps us embrace our own finitude, our own limitation. We often impose expectations upon ourselves that we can never meet. We expect ourselves to achieve more, do more, get more things done on our to-do list. And he says part of Sabbath keeping is to bring you back to the humble place where you realize you are less capable than you like to think. And it's a good thing. Right after that on the list, he talks about slowing down. This is where you hear the wisdom of Dallas Willard and what he told John Ortberg. A Sabbath, either part of a day or a whole day, forces you to slow your life, the pace of it, how much you try to squeeze into it down to a far more healthy pace. Then last, number six on his list, he talks about how a Sabbath forces you to create boundaries. He writes, multitasking may be a virtue in certain limited settings, but it is disastrous as a way of life because it means that no one thing or person ever receives our total devotion. What a great way to frame Sabbath. That many of us, through the course of our week, are pulled in so many different directions that we're harried, we're stressed, and we're distracted. No one thing, in his phrasing, gets our total devotion. But what if you had a period of time where you extracted all those different competing interests? You simplified things down. And it was just about you and your well-being and connecting to the people that mattered and God. Can you feel how good that would be? How much you yearn for that? Now, what I want to do a little bit is talk to you about my own practice of Sabbath and fasting. And for me, they go hand in hand. Typically, if I'm fasting, I'm doing it on my Sabbath. And remember, the goal of a Sabbath, this is how it's explained in the Old Testament, is that a Sabbath is supposed to be holy, which is to say, distinct. It's supposed to be different from the rest of how you live your life the rest of your days. And i that's kind of the key idea for how I integrate it into my life. Now, to start, you need to know where my practice of Sabbath comes from. When I was a young pastor primarily at my church in Tucson, and then early on in my pastorate in New Mexico. I was a type A. I worked all the time. Uh, I would imagine that my average work week was 60 to 70 hours. Uh, the church I was in in New Mexico needed a lot of help 
needed a lot of rehabilitation. There were lots of things to be done, lots of new ideas to put in place, lots of people to train and to coach. So the work was never ending, and that's true for most pastors. The church will take as much time as you give it. You have to be the one to have your own boundaries. And what I found is that after the birth of my two kids, I realized in a conversation with my wife that I had been sinning, and yes, I do mean that word, I had been sinning against my family for years because of pastoral ministry. I had given the best of what I was to the church and to God's kingdom, and my family had gotten the dregs. And it still hurts a little bit to this day that I realize I'm never going to get back those first years of my kids' lives when dad just wasn't around. And so God gave me or taught me through the work of Foster and others about a Sabbath. And since the second half of my pastorate in New Mexico, I have, for the most part, without many exceptions, practiced a weekly Sabbath. Now, for me, here's what that looks like. On my Sabbath, I fast from work, which for me means I fast from being a pastor. Being a pastor is a funny kind of profession. You never really take that hat off. Even if you're at dinner at somebody's house, um, you are always the pastor. And even if they tell you that they don't look at you that way, it's always in play. So on my Sabbath, I take my pastor hat off. And barring an emergency or a crisis, I don't answer email, um, I don't answer texts, and I let my phone go to voicemail. For me on my Sabbath, I always fast from, this may surprise you, I fast from learning. Now, why is that the case? Well, because if you ask any of the people in the office with me, they know by now if there's not music playing in my office, then there's a podcast playing because I'm always trying to learn. I always read, right? You guys have seen my office. You see how many books I have. Um, And I read those because I want to learn and I want to excel at my calling of being a pastor. But what that means is for my Sabbath to be distinct, I have to lay down my natural inclination of being a lifelong learner. And so I do. I don't learn anything new on my Sabbath. Typically, my Sabbath is a Friday or a Saturday. Sometimes it's been a Monday in the past. It can never be a Sunday for me. Sunday is, of course, as you might imagine, a work day for me. When you pick your Sabbath will be dependent upon your own life's rhythm and the own the, the needs of your own chosen career. So here are some things that I do on my Sabbath, again, to make it holy or different or distinct so that it fills me up, brings me rest, and helps me walk then into the rest of my week, able and ready to serve my neighbors and God's purposes in the world as a pastor of a congregation. Some of the things I do is that I cook. Now, I think we've talked about that before. You know that I like to cook, and that's one of my hobbies. But here's what I mean. I like to slow cook. Nothing that's going to be fast. So I like to, on my Sabbath, go to the grocery store because that's relaxing. It doesn't seem like a chore. And I pick a meal that's going to take me time to prepare. And so for an hour, an hour and a half, I will be in the kitchen cooking a meal, usually dinner, for my family, assuming we're around Manassas. That's relaxing, that's meaningful, that's recuperative for me. And it's different from the rest of my week when my time tends to be a little more stretched, and it doesn't allow me to cook over such a long period of time. On my Sabbath, I also try to take a very long walk. Now, I typically try to walk a few times a week to get some exercise, but on my Sabbath, because my life is so simplified, I have more time to take the longest walk of my week. I will do it sometimes with my kids, and we usually have a wonderful conversation about all kinds of things. I can check in on them, see how they're doing, but sometimes I just do it by myself. And I meditate, or I pray, or I'm just quiet. 
One of the things I like to do on my Sabbath is I like to write. I like to engage a real passion of mine, a hobby of mine, that oftentimes I just don't have the energy or the headspace to pursue at any other time during the week. And it may seem like writing is work, and certainly it's laborious and sometimes can feel like toil, but it's really the only time that I have to do it. And for me, it's a neat thing to be able to put onto paper some of what I have been experiencing or learning throughout the former week, the week that just transpired before my Sabbath. I practice a few spiritual disciplines on my Sabbath, some of the ones we've already talked about in this uh, sermon series. I do some purposeful remembering. Um, I continue my rhythm of fixed hour prayer. And of course, one of the things I like to do is spend a lot of time with my family because my career sometimes keeps us apart more than I'd like. So often we'll share a movie, we'll have an outing. This is the shape of my Sabbath. And it fits my life the way that you ought to make your holy or distinct Sabbath fit yours. One last little footnote before we end the video Um, Let me give you a way to reframe how you view the last few months during the COVID-19 pandemic. What if you looked at it like a Sabbath? What if this were a season of extended rest or simplification during which we were forced to unclutter our lives a little bit, slow down, and see things differently. If it's a Sabbath, then maybe, despite the anxiety about all the health concerns, this will be restorative for us. And just maybe God is showing us things during this Sabbath that he wants us to carry forward as things return to some semblance of normal. What if what we have been experiencing together, especially those of us who are Christians and in churches, is no more or no less than the opportunity to have an extended Sabbath. That's all for now. I will see you again on Sunday, and we will talk about the third spiritual discipline or habit of disengagement or subtraction.